I always said that that was as good as it was because we had great reference. And again, if you arm great artists with great reference, you're, you know, and a great data set, you're going, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's, it's used to lose at that point. You've done everything you can, but that, I think that is the sort of, the trifecta, you know, to, to make a movie like this. Hi. So, you've described a process where the actor and the director are receiving the images. Um, but you haven't talked about them interacting with the objects. Has there been any work on that, uh, for both um, in terms of the actors and the director? So you keep saying, for example, the director wants to move an object, he can actually do it. Yeah, we could move. Everything was valuable. There's two, two, there's two phases. One is the, uh, the digital assets that exist that, that are not represented on stage. You know, and we, we, just, we have an operator and you can move everything in there. It's, again, Jim will just point the camera and say, this, move it here, move it here. And you can select every object. And then Matt, Matt's group on a, an interactive level, there's prop interaction. It's stuff that's in the set. Yeah, the next clip we're going to show actually uh, demonstrates some of this. But the set was like the, the framework. All the basic pieces, things you, you had to touch or affected your performance. Um, were laid out on the stage in a way that, that matched the, the digital set. And then, of course, the CG elements are kind of like a 3D set dressing. You know, the virtual greens and virtual smoke and clouds and everything else. But the basic framework was typically there on the physical set. So the actors understood, okay, I need to go here. I need to lift this up. I need to watch out for that or trip over this. So we wanted to make sure they had everything they needed in terms of affecting their performance and giving them feedback. So it seemed intuitive for them. They didn't have to imagine things or mind anything. That was something we wanted to avoid. Yeah, miming is something we definitely stayed away from. It's, it, it, anything that was interactive in any way was in the model. Yeah, if they had a gun, give them a gun. Give them, make sure it's the right way. You know, show that force that they have to exert. That was really the much. I guess my question is a little bit more about um, augmented reality. So could they interact with ah, a digital okay. object using um, either um, the glove? Or a heads-up display? That, that's the nature of my question. You know, we, we've messed around with that, in fact, back in the we, we try to, it's, and we have a, we have a, new, a new system that's an onboard camera, on virtual camera that can uh, accommodate some of that. Um, what's interesting about that is, uh, maybe that's, maybe that's going to be the, the future, but right now I think the interactive and collaborative nature of working with the artists and how being able to take stuff offline, particularly if it's a big rebuild, rather than just moving an object. Uh, if you want to fundamentally change the art direction, uh, we, we tend to get, get, you know try to keep Jim on track by moving him to the next the next problem, the next question, and then have somebody do it offline and then reintroduce it into the into the model. All right. yeah. I, I think the most effective uh, visualization process or, or uh, approach and integration of that kind of technology that we've seen in production it is to put that kind of head rig or whatever it is on the actor, let them see where they are. Let them see what it ultimately is going to look like. Get, get them familiar with it, and then take it off and let them act. Right. Because what you see, if they have that on them, they start thinking, yeah. you know, and that's bad. And you can see the performance right away. And then if there's a subtle hesitation, you know, it, it shows up immediately. So it's great to get them familiar with it. In fact, one of the, as far as next gen uh, stage elements that, that I want to put out there are basically big frames that are, that are more windows to this virtual world that you can move around that we're tracking in real time. So if you need to look down a hallway, or up a trail, or whatever it is, over a cliff, you can move it around and tilt it down. I see what's down there. You know, I don't have to imagine that. So I have more options to view this virtual world than I'm interacting. Well, we just, we need to solve multi-trend on, on, on the yeah, image track. Yeah, right. right. But yeah. That's, it's coming on the next gen of yeah. software view. So again, we can do multiple feeds at the stage for actors. Thank you. Okay, so we covered some of the basics here of how we capture motion, how we uh, get the performance and apply that to a character for the body and the face. Now we're going to talk about something a little even more complex, and that's layering all these things to make it an animation that may be made up of multiple characters. So what we have here is the, the Banshee writing. It's a, a snapshot of how we put those pieces together to, to create the Banshee motion. So we'll kind of talk through as these clips are playing. It's um, a little lengthy. It gives us enough time to really describe what you're seeing here. So this is a good shot of, of our fearless director <laughs> flying and, and creating a, a base motion layout for the Banshee path. So he has these 
set pieces here that are referenced. So he understands where that is in the actual virtual set, and he's creating a flight path accordingly just to design the basic layout. So it's, it's really the layout of the flight, where that, that creature should be in that world. What was that? It, it, invariably, when people see this, they ask, well, why can't you keyframe? Why don't you just keyframe a path? You can, and we have done in the past. The simple fact of the matter is this gives us a very quick, interactive way to assess a, a basic path. Uh, we can you know, augment it so it, it has the right you know, forward velocity, and you know, there's a lot of things we, we, make, we make adjustments to, to make it clean. But in a very, very quick and instantaneous way, he's able to, uh, we're able to map basically a choreography of flight and then understand what, what that means to the cameras and the sequence. Uh, it, it significantly reduces the engine process because when we hand this off to animators to go in and animate the creature and, and actually have the branchy flying in here, they, are, they, are, they know these, this is the path. It's not going to change, you know, because the cameras are shot to it. So there's a, we even have that we've done somewhere. We kick it off. We have a path that we like, a specific action that we like. We, we either animate it in house or just kick it down to the weather. We re receive a relatively final animation before we ever put cameras on them or even put the, put the active performance on them and have them ride. So we have integrated animation so the actors can see what's going on with the creature. So this is probably a good example of that. Yeah, it kicks me out of there, so we'll watch this bit again. So you, you can see these monitors off to the side, so art directors evaluating the shot, making sure all the elements are in the proper place. So a little ditty to this. We, we, when, we, uh, when we started this, we had flying creatures uh, and the, the helicopters. So we brought in a couple of professional stunt pilots to train, train us uh, as to flight dynamics of helicopters so that we could puppeteer them properly. Uh, what, we, what we ended up doing is we put five or six guys out in the volume and it very quickly became a game of twister and we're running into each other and we realized that doesn't work. So what we did then is we, we basically, we set up in gym and we would literally well, be like two kids chasing each other around with, with a banshee and a, and, a, and a helicopter and literally create moments, little vignettes essentially to, 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 that would either cover a specific uh, moment in the movie or uh, it went uh, as a sort of generic vignette that was a bigger part of the, of the major battle. But again, what, what we could do with those very quickly is we could act out 10 or 12, we could kick ideas around and then push it all down to weta and say, instead of saying start from scratch, here's a jumping off point. You know, uh, and it, it, it had incredible value as we went forward. So it's a, it's a really instant way to get, to get uh, paths. So because this is all being tracked and recorded in real time, Jim can immediately go to a monitor and look at that performance just like the live action. Now he's watching the actual playback of his performance in the environment. So he's checking the, the choreography of that performance. So you can see just the framework of the set piece, that's all we need for this. It's just, just enough information to create the, the blocking of the action. There's about four or five little markers on that wireframe prop that he has in his hand. And that motion was scaled up by 24 times? Depending if we shot a quarter, quarter inch scale or a half inch scale, depending on, on the scale of the environment. And then you would augment the, the pace we were moving at uh, to try replicate or get close to the, the kind of speeds we wanted. So once you have the basic performance of the layout of the action, then we can layer in the different bits of action on top of that, which include, of course, the rider and the details of the creature, in this case, was the banshee. So here we have a shot of this combined performance. So this, this is a good example of other set pieces that were interactive with the performance. We have the rider, the stunt rider, on a banshee rig in the upper left seat here and, and, and lower left. And then in the upper right, we actually have uh, performer providing the base motion for the head, neck, and wings of the banshee, just for reference, so, so Jim could identify the, the flapping patterns, head turns, just subtleties of neck movement, and then relay that to animators downstream. Yeah, it didn't serve a, a purpose as, as in capture motion that could be used, but what it did very quickly was allow us to place the camera, because you, you, what we've discovered very quickly, you shoot with a, with a, a, a large board-like creature, and in really like lengthy wings, placing the camera, 
where wind flaps go on is really important because you, you, there's a lot of there's a lot of space that becomes unusable. You can't stand the 